Good morning. Good morning. My name is Pete Daly, and as CEO of the U.S. Naval Institute in Annapolis, I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning. Uh, we're pleased to bring this program to you today. We think it's timely. The topic, fiscal cliff, what does this mean for defense and for national security? And before we continue, I'd ask our audience to uh, stand up, and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We're fortunate to have sponsorship for this event from USAA, and uh, we appreciate that support very much. And we have with us today Mark Hildebrand and Gina Gurk from USAA, and we thank you for joining us. It's my honor to introduce our opening keynote speaker, former Deputy Secretary Bill Lynn. And before I make that introduction, I just wanted to let our audience know that there will be questions and answers, and we will pass, we will pass mics around uh, with staff members, and we just ask that you use those mics. And I'd also, just one more time, like to ask everybody to check your cell phones to make sure they're on silent. Thank you. As mentioned, our program today is on the fiscal cliff and the impacts it'll have on the military and the defense industry that supports our military. And we're most fortunate to have, as today's keynote speaker, a man who brings 30 years of experience uh, in defense. Most impressive to me is his progression of important program and resource positions held within DOD. As a guy who did time down in J-8, PBAD, and places in the basement, I watched as he served as director of pa &E Program Analysis and Evaluation from 1993 to 1997. I also saw him rise up to be Under Secretary of Defense Comptroller, where he served from 1997 to 2001. After a short stint in industry, he came back as the 30th Deputy Secretary of Defense, where he ran the business and resource processes of DOD and also championed defense, cybersecurity, space strategy, and the energy programs of the department. In industry, Mr. Lin was previously Senior Vice President, Government Operations and Strategy at Raytheon. He took his current position as chairman and CEO of DRS in January of this year. All of this makes him the perfect choice to talk to us today on this topic. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome William J. Lind III. Thanks a lot, Pete. Thanks, thanks very much, Pete. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to be here and uh, thank uh, the Naval Institute for uh, sponsoring this, uh, this timely event. Uh, Pete said he picked this out three months ago, so he, uh, I think his ability to anticipate the gridlock in Washington uh, is, is impressive, if un unfortunate. Uh, the, uh, the forum, I think, is a strategic opportunity uh, for uh, some distinguished thought leaders, uh, that's not me, that's the people coming later, uh, to weigh the challenges and the opportunities of a new fiscal cycle that will shape U.S. national security for the next several years. We arrive here this morning at the fifth inflection point of our nation's defense establishment since World War II. By inflection point, I mean a fundamental shift in the direction of the budget that's going to have a strategic impact on the force itself. The first three inflection points came at the end of conflicts, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. The fourth was more similar to today, when fiscal austerity in the mid-1980s uh, triggered budget cuts that were then later accelerated by the end of the Cold War. Now, the current inflection point has uh, characteristics of both st strands of prior inflection points. It's triggered largely by the deficits that we're facing today, 
but it's also coming as we wind down two conflicts. Indeed, we're still in the midst of the, the Afghanistan conflict. So at the forum, I think our central question is what does this fifth inflection point mean and what people are calling the fiscal cliff, what does it mean for national security? I think as we debate the answers, we should start with history. Because at the core of the issue, the U.S. is regaining its footing in the aftermath of a devastating financial crisis. The United States has rebounded from recessions in nearly every decade of its history, from the Panic of 1797 through to the recovery of the Great Recession of 2008-2009. While this last one may have been more severe than most, the fact is we have a pretty good track record of rejuvenating our economy after these fiscal cataclysms. History, in fact, shows that some of our greatest national achievements have occurred right after financial meltdowns. History also shows that some of the great transformations in our military posture occurred after similar fiscal crises in the defense budget. History is adamant about one thing. It reminds us that the heartbeat of American renewal begins to pump much harder after the nation has been struck by crisis. Best-selling author Kurt Anderson wrote an essay titled Reset about the phenomenon of American renewal and growth after fiscal crises. After the Panic of 1837, the electric telegraph was patented, creating the means for rapid transcontinental communications that sped up business and financial transactions like never before. IT powerhouses, Apple and Microsoft, emerged shortly after the recession of the late 1970s. Similarly, American warfighters have demonstrated a great propensity for reinvention in the aftermath of fiscal cliffs. To put the current cycle into the perspective of the U.S. defense industry, all you have to do is go back to the end of World War II when our industry was, was in its infancy. Before the war, there really wasn't a defense industry to speak of in America. Commercial giants like the Ford Motor Company either converted production lines or simply built new factories to manufacture defense equipment. The Ford Willow plant was constructed near Detroit to build bombers in the early 1940s and produced more than 5,000 B-24s in one stretch from 1944 to 1945. For the entire war effort, 300,000 aircraft were built at rates that will never be seen again. For the entire during the war, defense went up in size to become the largest U.S. industry, whereas before the war it was 41st in size. And it went from 1% of GNP to 40%. But after the war, industry contracted at a precipitous rate. 12 million American jobs were ground up in a massive economic blender as defense cuts reached 90%. Boeing cut its workforce from 50,000 employees to 7,500. Lockheed shifted gears into the larger and more lucrative commercial aircraft business. And auto companies like Ford simply converted their lines back to commercial production of trucks and automobiles. An industry created by the onset of war was on the verge of being destroyed by the end of that war. Yet despite this upheaval, U.S. military planners continued to invest in new technology and innovation. In 1945, R&D began on breakthrough technology with the development of the B-47 jet bomber. The very next year, a contract was awarded to Boeing for the design of the B-52 to be powered by eight jet engines. The advantages of jet aviation, especially during the years not long after World War II when few nations had it, were tremendous. This technology investment continued as defense spending dropped after Vietnam, and the Pentagon began to develop stealth technology. In the mid-1970s, work began on Operation Hopeless Diamond, a word play on the odd shape of the F-117 stealth fighter. The radar deflecting shape 
fuselage of mostly composite materials, non-afterburning engines, and electronic jamming systems made it virtually invisible to radar. Of course, today, stealth is one of our military's greatest advantages. But the Pentagon knows that without careful stewardship in the lean years of the 1970s, stealth might have been left on the whiteboard instead of deployed in the force as it is today. Technology investments continued after the Cold War, when the Berlin Wall came tumbling down and the Soviet Union disintegrated. A 1992 congressional report titled After the Cold War, Living with Lower Defense Spending, said the US didn't have an obvious enemy, and as such, defense needs were, quote, unclear. Nevertheless, defense spending plummeted by one third, and an industry of nearly four million people was reduced to a little more than two million. Yet even during the post-Cold War era, investment continued for unmanned aerial vehicle technology. And it wasn't long before UAVs proved their value in the Gulf War. That's the first Gulf War. On top of providing a new ISR advantage, an Iraqi army unit actually surrendered to a pioneer drone off the USS Wisconsin. Now, in 1990, there were only a handful of UAVs in the US inventory. Today, there are thousands, even tens of thousands. So over and over again, since the end of World War II, American technology has changed the face of war. Which means the central question, I think, of today's forum, what the current fiscal cliff means for national security, is a personal one for all of us. Our decisions will shape history. And we have to live up to the challenges as our forerunners did, by using our still formidable financial clout to widen the technology advantage we have. Our challenge is not just to protect national security and manage the slowdown, but to use our unparalleled level of resources to shape the future of war and change the paradigm. Still accounting for roughly half of all global defense spending, we can use our investments combined with our doctrinal flexibility and the superiority of our fighting forces to leap ahead. But first, of course, we need to know what to plan for. And the truth is it's difficult to know where, when, and who we will fight next. In fact, my former boss, Defense Secretary Bob Gates, said we're, we have a perfect record in that regard. We have never gotten it right. But we're much better at forecasting how we will fight, especially since the US is in the best position to develop next generation technology that can shape the face of war. In my view, there are three strategic factors that will impact how we will fight over the next decade that in turn should influence our decisions on military spending. The first has to do with lethality. For centuries, lethality followed a linear path with the wealthiest nations wielding the greatest lethal power. But this linear relationship between economic and military might is no longer exclusive. Terrorist groups with few resources can now mount devastating attacks. Insurgents can defeat our most advanced armor with fertilizer bombs. Rogue states seek nuclear weapons, and criminals have world-class cyber capabilities. In fact, lethality at the low end of the economic spectrum can now rival that at the high end. As such, our military must retain a portfolio of capabilities with maximum versatility across the widest spectrum of conflict to be able to confront high-end and low-end threats at the same time. We cannot prepare exclusively for a conflict with a near-peer competitor, but nor can we focus on counterinsurgency and terrorism alone. We'll need the fifth generation stealth fighters and advanced helicopters in the air, but we'll need counter IED technology and counterterrorism specialists on the ground. We'll need next generation manned and unmanned long range strike capabilities, as well as networked special operations and armored forces. We'll need the world's most powerful fleet to keep open vital sea lanes and nimble coastal patrols 
to protect our domestic harbors. We'll need advanced capabilities in the traditional domains of land, sea, and air, while bolstering our capabilities in the newer domains of space and cyberspace. The challenge is to continue these critical investments with the budget available to us, still the largest in the world, and to create transformational technology and the world's most versatile force. The second strategic factor that will impact how we fight is the challenges involving the duration of conflicts. Since the end of the Cold War, we've tended to focus our planning on conflicts that would be relatively short in duration. Desert Storm was the prototype, a month-long aerial bombardment followed by an extraordinarily successful 100-hour ground war. But this construct hasn't fit our post-9-11 reality, when the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have both lasted longer than US participation in World War I and World War II combined. This has put an enormous burden on our troops and especially on their families. If this represents a new paradigm instead of an aberration, something we really can't know for sure today, a future force must be built in, uh, with a capacity to rotate units throughout these long deployments. Such a challenge would include planning for long duration, low intensity conflicts, as well as the high end kinetic phase. It would mean that the long term costs of extended conflicts needs to be fa factored into our financial calculus. The third strategic factor that could impact how we fight and plan is perhaps the most ominous of all, the advent of asymmetric warfare. Battlegrounds used to be meeting places of like on like, cavalry on cavalry, armor on ar armor, and so on. We faced enemies whose framework was similar to our own. So the challenge was to develop superior people, superior capabilities, and su superior tactics within that framework. But that like on like paradigm is rapidly disappearing. With America's military so dominant, adversaries by necessity are forced to be creative to avoid confronting us head on. They use asymmetric tools to undercut our advantages or even use our advantages against us. The Taliban and Al-Qaeda rarely engage our military directly. Instead, they use IEDs and they try to drag out the conflicts to drain our resources. Even national powers seek asymmetric capabilities, like anti-access and area denial weapons. Rather than confront our traditional conventional advantages, they're seeking to develop precision-guided ballistic missiles that try to push us away from the battlefield. They develop anti-satellite weapons to disrupt our command and control. When it comes to the range of asymmetric threats, there is nothing more transformational than cyber warfare. Warfare itself has been transformed three times in the past couple of decades. First by the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, then by the Atomic Revolution in the middle of the 20th century, and now today at the advent of the 21st century by the Information Age. The most recent Pentagon review titled Sustaining U.S. Global Leadership Priorities in the 21st Century in 21st Century Defense recognizes this challenge. Development of cyber weapons carry, carries a low barrier to entry, which means those trying to cause us harm no longer need an industrial complex to develop lethal capabilities. A small group of trained programmers using off-the-shelf equipment can develop a power, powerful offense that can be deployed with great effect and secrecy. Worse yet, the cyber threat is moving up the ladder of escalation. Their initial use was to exploit information and then to disrupt networks. But now we are seeing the emergence of tools to cause physical destruction. If our networks are compromised, our adversaries can now blind our satellites, jam our communications, hamper our logistics, and make our smart bombs dumb again. 
Today, information technology has become the fifth domain of warfare. It's critical to military effectiveness, along with land, sea, air, and space. Even as we speak, potential adversaries are developing cyber weapons. We need to exceed their development and create offensive capabilities of our own as a deterrent. We need state-of-the-art defenses and increased intelligence to help us determine when a cyber storm is gathering. And because we are so dependent on information technology, we must have the ability to quickly restore cyber capacity, but also be able to operate in a degraded cyber environment. The Pentagon established the US Cyber Command to protect our military networks. NATO has cited cybersecurity as a 21st century priority with network upgrades underway that my company and others are working on. Protecting our IT systems will require more than just a perimeter defense of firewalls alone to form a digital Maginot line. We need active defenses that assume a level of penetration, enable us to hunt for and respond to intruders on our networks. Perhaps even more compelling is the stark reality that cyber attacks can easily reach our homeland. They can threaten our critical infrastructure, from power grids to transportation networks. They can threaten our institutions, as the attacks on the IMF, Citibank, NASDAQ, and the oil and gas industry have proved. The threats don't stop, though, with direct attacks. Our competitiveness can be threatened through the rampant cyber theft of intellectual property. Since information technology underpins our military and our economic might, the only responsible way to deal with this growing threat is to marshal all of the available resources of a dynamic and creative society. The US and our allies must employ the full range of tools, trade, diplomatic, and military. The challenge is not the militaries alone. In addition to the Pentagon, we need a response that encompasses all of, all of government and engages Wall Street and Main Street as well. We need both the generals and the general managers in the fight. We need both public and private institutions engaged, fostering information sharing about cyber threats among federal, state, local, and private institutions. And we need a system that doesn't tie the president's hands, that instead allows the government to take action to protect and warn private institutions in real time if they are the subject of a cyber attack. To sum up, these three factors, the increased access to lethality, the longer duration of warfare, and the growing set of asymmetric threats, each pose challenges to our national security. Each represents an element of the future battlefield and therefore demands our attention today. Each represents what needs to be protected as we emerge from this fiscal crisis. Defense planners today have a difficult job. They have inherited an era when the information age is layered on top of the Industrial Revolution and the Atomic Age. They must maintain a long-range view, even as they do short-range planning. They must be able to do more with less and leverage the investments of today to unleash the transformational capabilities of tomorrow. The good news is that today's military planners can take a page from history and live by the wisdom of our forerunners. Secretary Gates once said, the current period represents one of those rare chances to match virtue to necessity. I think he got it exactly right. And I'm confident we will get it right this time as well as we step up to the defense and security challenges of the new millennium. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about such an important topic. Thank you for considering these vital questions. And thank you for what you do for the defense of our nation. Happy to take uh, questions, whatever topic you like. Thank you, sir. Timothy Walton with Delic Systems. 
Um, you spoke about the, the, the crucial role of innovation in some of these downturns historically. Um, and I, I speak to a worrying trend. Historically, sort of dep uh, Department of Defense has spent about 18% per contract on R&D. And uh, now we're down to 11 or 10%. So uh, now that we go into a defense downturn, we might not be able to reap what we had sown during the buildup. How is indus how should industry plan for this? How the should the department plan for this? Well, I, I think if you look at the at the history of the the prior downturns, what you you tend to see is that actually R and D spending tends to plateau rather than go down dramatically. Procurement spending is what goes down. Indeed, procurement spending, if you look historically, has gone up twice as fast as the budget as a whole, but it's also fallen twice as fast as the budget as a whole. So when we lost a, a third of uh, uh, our defense spending in the, from you know, 90 to 96 or seven, procurement spending fell by almost two thirds, so kind of that two to one ratio. But R&D spending was, was flat and stagnant, but it actually didn't, didn't collapse in quite the, uh, the same way. So I think in, you know, in some ways you're, you need to look for a similar pattern here where you're gonna see you know, cuts in, in investment accounts, but you're gonna try and protect the seed corn in the R&D accounts so that you're able to achieve those transformational capabilities five and 10 and 15 years out. Over here. Uh, yes, my, I'm Russell King, federal employee. And I have a question about the, the, the number of ships in the Navy. I think right now it might be 270 something, I think, ships in the Navy. And during the Reagan administration, they went up to 600. And um, I know numbers are not everything, but they are something. And I know during Theodore Roosevelt's uh, administration, I believe we increased the Navy, and as well as the Reagan administration. But is there any recommendation you would give to executive leadership today? Uh, in terms of uh, the need to expand our Navy, in terms of the number of ships? Well, I mean, I think ship, is gonna, is, ship count is one measure of capability. I would not say it's actually the most, it, it, it's important, but not the most important. Uh, I, you're right, I think the number actually, I think is in the 280s right now. The, the plan would take it a little bit over uh, 300. I, I think we have been bouncing around 300 as about the right number to cover our international commitments for you know, a couple of decades. Uh, so I, I'm pretty comfortable in that range. It'll go up or down 10 or 15 ships. To be able to do that, uh, one of the things that you have to do is you have to have a mix of ships. Uh, and this corresponds to the kind of the high end, low end uh, uh, comment I made during the prepared remarks, is you can't, you can't have even a 280, 300, 320 ship Navy if every, uh, if every ship costs you two or three billion dollars. Uh, no matter what level of defense spending you get, you're not gonna be able to, uh, to protect the ship count in that level. So we need a, a, uh, effectively a high-low mix. Uh, it used to be with frigates. It's now the littoral combat ship is, that, uh, that is the one that helps us maintain. And I think that's, that's uh, an important element uh, as we go forward is to be able to have uh, capabilities that meet critical national security needs, but, but that aren't at that uh, exclusively at that high end. And if we're able to maintain programs like that, I think we can maintain the ship count where it needs to be in that range around 300. And I guess you're gonna have uh, former Secretary Lehman here to talk about the, the 600 ship uh, uh, Navy, and, and may, may, he may have a different perspective, I don't know. Uh, up at the top here? Oh, I'm, was there? Oh, sorry, I didn't. I'm, so, is this kind of like Ronald Reagan? I paid for that. Right? Yeah. After World War II, we
Well, I mean, I think since World War II, we made two, two fundamental changes. Uh, one was the establishment of the, of the construct we have today, the Department of Defense, the, the CIA, the National Security Establishment. I think that was fundamental to, to uh, the structure that we have today and, the, and to be able to fight the Cold War. In the middle of the 1980s, we made a, 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 a second big change, which was strengthening the, uh, the joint side of our military, strengthening the, the, the chairman and the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Joint Staff, and most importantly, the, the uh, uh, combatant commanders. Uh, I think that's, that's what's given us, uh, it's helped uh, given us a platform to that integrated capability that's been so effective uh, today. I don't see right now the, the need for that more, that, you know, that kind of fundamental reordering uh, uh, that we have today in sort of in an organizational way. I think we do need to follow the path that we've been on. We need to strengthen, as we have since 9-11, the special operations uh, uh, counterinsurgency uh, capabilities. Uh, I think we need to protect that, that, that growth that we've had even as we uh, face a slowdown in the budget. But I don't see a, a, a case for a fundamental restructuring. I mean, people occasionally have opposed Proposed, you know, abandoning the military department structure. Uh, I, I don't, I don't see a, a reason to do that, and I don't see that it would uh, significantly enhance our capabilities. Oh, sorry, up in the back. So you're, you're trying. You want me to prove myself wrong that we can that we can we we can now uh, now get it right or prove Bob Gates wrong? Uh, well, I think I'll stay with the the way I structured it. Is I, I can't tell you where it's it's you know is it going to be in you know in, in Southwest Asia again or is it you know the Korean Peninsula or you know the islands? You know, there's obviously a lot of conflicts around the islands in in the South China Sea. I, it, it hard to hard to anticipate. Uh, and, and I think to take Gates's comment further, with possibly the exception of the, uh, uh, the Iraq war uh, uh, under, under the younger President Bush, uh, I think if all of the other conflicts uh, that you look at over the last several decades, if you were looking even six months in advance, you wouldn't have known. We were going to maintain you know, Desert Storm, Grenada, uh, you know, Panama. In, in most cases, we didn't know uh, Afghanistan, we didn't know where we were going to go even six months, and even, even that close uh, up. So to come back to your question, the one that kept me up at night in the department, the one I spent the most time on was cyber. I do think something is going to happen in cyber. And I, I, I think, as I alluded to in the remarks, I think there are two trends in cyber that are troubling. One is this, this escalation in terms of the destructiveness of, a, of, a, of attacks. It, I mean, for a long time, they weren't really attacks at all. It was exploitation. It was theft. People were stealing things. Very bad and very corrosive over the long haul when it, it's our core intellectual property, but not a classic attack. It's moved up that scale to disruption. People can take out networks. People can deny our capabilities. Uh, but now we're seeing destructive capabilities. People can actually destroy things, you know, destroy power plants, destroy uh, 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 capabilities with cyber capabilities. When you combine that trend with the fact that the capabilities are almost sure to move out from where they stand today, which is they're largely the province of large nation states. But the, as I said, the barriers to entry here are low. You know, a couple of dozen guys in flip-flops drinking Red Bull can you know, develop a, a pretty good set, set of capabilities very fast. And so I, I think those two, what we're going to see is a marriage of those two trends. We're going to move up that ladder of escalation, and we're going to move out from nation states where we have a much better ability to deter to rogue states, to terrorist groups, where we have very little ability to deter them. We don't have assets we can hold at risk. So when you see a marriage of those two trends of, of destructive 
uh, capabilities and malicious actors who are hard to deter, that's real trouble. And I think we're, we're on that path. And so in my view, we have a window of opportunity to protect our, our core assets. And by that, I really mean our critical infrastructure, power grid, transportation. We need to do a better job of being able to protect our core assets uh, before you see a marriage of those, uh, those two trends. And the trick is we don't know how long that window of opportunity is. It could be, you know, it could be quite a long time or it could be you know, a very, uh, very short period of time. So I think it, we, we do need to, uh, to act quickly. And I think if we do, I think we can start to uh, uh, lower fairly dramatically the consequences of that kind of attack. So the bottom line is I, I don't know who when or, or even where this is going to occur, but I think we know the what. I, th I think we are going to see that kind of, you know, from somewhere, somehow, we're going to see some major cyber uh, in event. Other? All the way in the back. Logistics have evolved a lot over the last 10 years, particularly in uh, distribution and deployments. Uh, what do you see going forward in, in logistics, particularly um, with the pivot to, to Asia and the budget constraints? Well, I mean, I think in, in my mind, the, the biggest uh, technological question with logistics uh, has to do with basically fuel. You know, how are we, uh, how are we gonna get uh, power to the battlefield. Uh, right now, I mean, that, that, it, that and kind of food and water dominate our, our logistics train. If you developed, if you had breakthroughs in fuel cells or some other uh, related technology, it would have a, a, a dramatic impact on, our, uh, on, on, on logistics. It would, it would change uh, fundamentally uh, how we fight. We have, we, I, don't, I, don't, I don't quite, I'm not a tech, Technologists, but I, I don't see that right now on the on the horizon. But I I, I think it's one of those things that could uh, come come fast when it comes. There there are uh, there is research and there, there's a lot of different concepts about how we might uh, might do that. And so that's 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 where I would watch. Am I sorry? Oh, sorry. Looking too high. Uh, Bruce Wooden, and I'm an engineer. <clears throat> we have always, uh, in the military, depended upon a commercial industrial base to support our basic uh, work. Right now, the world has globalized, and in fact, much of our industrial base resides in potential adversaries. How do we best uh, utilize the worldwide globalized industrial base to foster our own military capabilities? Well, I mean, it's a complex question. I, I think defense industry is on the trend that, that other industries have followed. Just as it's, 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 although it's a little further behind, it, 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 has, it, it, has be, it is becoming a global uh, industry. Uh, it is not there. It's more, you know, maybe where the auto industry was 20, 30 years ago when we were you know, very focused on buying American cars, and you were somewhat unpatriotic to buy a German or a Japanese car. Uh, nowadays, people, I don't think, think of it that way. The, you, you know, the German, Japanese cars are built here. Our cars are, are sold widely abroad. It's a, it's a, a global economy. Uh, with some help from the government, our, our, our auto industry is competing, you know, very well uh, in, in that, that global market. And I think we need for our defense industry to, to follow a similar pattern. We need, you know, we have, you know, half the defense economy in the world. It gives us, uh, an enormous advantage in terms of building the industry. We don't need to be, uh, protectionist, uh, given, given that, uh, advantage. And I think that we can compete, uh, more than, uh, effectively in overseas markets in that context, and I think we should let overseas companies compete here. I think that's how you're gonna get the best technology at the best price. Did I miss someone up back there? Thank you, sir. Um, 
Over the last 10 years, do you think DOD has underestimated the rise of Chinese capabilities? And do you think now as China is manifesting its capabilities more, do you think the department will reorient the services to focus on it? I, you know, I, I think people have been talking about you know, Chinese capabilities for a long time. I don't, I don't think we've kind of missed uh, developments there. Um, I, you know, the, the challenge is that as the Chinese economy grows, its, its military capability is going to grow with it. Uh, there's, that's an inevitable trend. The, uh, the question is, how do we manage the relationship in a way that uh, military conflict doesn't become the way that, or military, uh, a military conflict doesn't become the way that we solve our problems. That we, we solve our problems by negotiation, by trade, by the other dimensions uh, of the relationship, while you know we have to retain our, our ability to uh, defend ourselves and our allies, but the, the hope is that you would never it would never come to that. Julian Tolbert, U.S. Air Force. So I was intrigued by um, your comments about duration as a key attribute of, of future conflict. Um, the Last year's defense strategic guidance, or earlier this year's guidance, says it will no longer size U.S. forces to co conduct long-term stability operations, yet you clearly see a need for uh, rotational capability and longer duration. I was wondering if you could comment about future requirement for sizes of ground forces, U.S. Army and U.S. Marines particularly, but how does that translate into overall U.S. posture? I mean, I think that's one of the hardest questions we face, and uh, is what is the right size and role for large ground force formations? It is actually, I think, the question that bedeviled us in the in the early 1990s. Uh, we we similarly thought that the need for those kinds of uh, forces had uh, largely evaporated as the as the Berlin Wall fell and the Warsaw Pact threat uh, went away. Uh, I, in my view, we oversteered. Uh, and uh, partly because we weren't, it, it goes back to kind of this Gates rule, we weren't imagining enough to see where they were gonna, gonna be used. And I, I worry similarly that we're in, a, in a, the same kind of situation. We can't see it. And, it, it's, and I, I agree with the defense. It's very, very hard to imagine, you know, the construct, you know, you know land wars in Asia, that doesn't sound, you know, where in the Southwest you know, Asia are you going to see that kind of conflict? Uh, I, I'm not sure we're going to you know, embark on the kind of very, very large counterinsurgency operations we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan any, any time in the near midterm future. So you, you, you're, you sort of run out of, but nevertheless, uh, as I said, our imagination hasn't been very good and it hasn't been very predictive. So I think we need to maintain the capability, I, I think doing it as the department's doing, you know, doing a, a lot of it in the reserves because you, you, you don't see an immediate need. That's, that's a classic case where you use the reserve forces, a hedge against uh, your, your failure to see the future. Uh, and you, because you have to, I mean, this is obviously an investment strategy too. You don't want to invest a lot of resources in something that you don't think you're gonna do. On the other hand, you want to hedge against things that you can't see from this point. So I, I think that's, that's what we're trying to do. I think that is, as I said, I think that's one of the biggest challenges uh, that we face in defense planning today. Sir, on the premise that, uh, you know, as you get more senior, and some of us in the room have experienced this, you get more senior, people don't tell you the truth all the time. You get less and less fresh information. So now you've had a chance to step out from your position as DepSecDef in January. And when you stepped out, and now you've had almost a year for people to again tell you the truth and say what they thought of <laughs> this or that that happened in defense, what's, uh, is there anything that strikes you that now that you've stepped away this time that you see something now more clearly or something that's been brought to your attention since you stepped away that uh, has come into focus? Or do you see it the same way? I mean, I, I don't think... Uh, things from where I sit now to where I was a year ago are, are dramatically different. Maybe, maybe the same people are telling me the same lies. I don't. I don't know. Uh, um, but it, it's. Um, 
So as, as one aside, uh, Don Pilling, who probably many of you, you know, I remember he presided at a frocking of an admiral ceremony, he was telling this new admiral, there are two great things, uh, two things you need to know about being an admiral. One is benefits are pretty great. You're, you're going to like it, you know, the house, the allowance is good. The other is you've heard the whole truth for the last time. You know, all those conversations you used to have, well, we can't tell the admiral this, or we better wait, and, you know, that's now you. So uh, there, there is, there is uh, uh, some of that, but I, I haven't found a, a dramatic one that I've gotten out and go, ah, that now I, yeah. Sir? So I have a question about cybersecurity. I know we have certain partnerships, I believe, with other nations on, on this, but I'm wondering whether or not you would trust Japan as a cybersecurity partner, giving them information about the vulnerabilities of our infrastructure, or, or do our cyber partners have that information? Well, I mean, I, yes, I would trust Japan. Uh, two, um, we, we have built the, the partnerships we've had we're, we're building out, we have something called the Five Eyes, many of you are familiar with, which is a, a intelligence sharing with a, sig, largely a signals intelligence. It goes back to World War II. They tend to be the most cy capable cyber actors in each of these countries, so we built out uh, from there, and that's with UK, Australia, uh, Canada. Um, uh, but, but we've built out into NATO, into, into non-NATO allies like Japan. And ultimately, you actually need to, you want to collaborate with, with people you don't even consider uh, allies. Because often there's a, a community of interest here in, in, uh, in uh, beating back uh, these kinds of attacks. It may, you know, terrorist groups, it may be in the interest of no nation state to enable these kinds of terrorist attacks. So I think you can find uh, a, a, an ability to collaborate and cooperate, at, uh, at least at some level, I think, with virtually any uh, responsible uh, nation state. And I, I'm fairly broad about who I, you know, I mean, certainly Russia, China, I'm, I'm putting in that capability. I mean, we have our differences at times, and even in this area, but I think one of the things that we want to do is build a basis for collaboration here, and that's actually one of the elements of, of making progress in this area. Good morning, sir. Lieutenant Commander Alaman from uh, CSIS. We're the only, not only a nation that's having a declining uh, budget. Our European allies are being devastated in their uh, combat capability. Can you speak to some of the implications of that to our traditional uh, partners and allies? Well, I mean, I think there, there are two things with, uh, uh, you know, the, the NATO, European, uh, uh, one is they need to keep up uh, a, a level of spending that allows them to be full participants in the, in the security challenges that we, we mutually face. And that's particularly, I mean, their financial crisis is, is if anything, worse than ours. And so their challenges are, are at least as significant. The other, uh, so but even given that, you need the, the, those core national security values need to be protected. The other part is they need to maintain a, a pace of, of technological development so that we're not so disparate that we can't fight together and that we can't uh, train uh, okay, my name is and Alex. exercise CQ together. Hey, that if, 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 if we get too far ahead, it, right now. It, it makes oh, it difficult to, uh, to collaborate. So, so I think you know, they don't have to have every element, and IKCA, uh, but we, we need right that now. ability to mesh, uh, mesh so those forces as we're actually doing very effectively now in Afghanistan and before that in Iraq. Suit, and I think that suit, pushes suit, and then come right NATO back, towards something that right would back, is politically right difficult, so you see me slide, uh, politically difficult for us as well. Is you need more specialization. My partner right here. You know, not matter. every country Whether needs every capability. To the, the to the extent suit. that they can focus, uh, you know, certain nations can focus on certain capabilities, and other nations can focus on others. You can get a far more uh, efficient uh, force. Uh, I, I, by not underestimating the political challenges of that, but I, I, do, I do think that it's, it's a, it, those are challenges we need to meet. Admiral Mike Mullen, for the last 18 months or so, perhaps longer, 
has been talking about the greatest threat to our national security is our economic and budgetary processes. I'd like to ask you to venture out on the limb and talk to us a little bit about your speculation for sequestration. Um, well, I, one, I agree with Mike that uh, the, the, the economic, uh, or I guess Mike's premise here is that economic weakness is a national security threat. And I, I agree with that. And so certainly over history, if you look, you know, no, no nation has lost its, its economic uh, vitality and retained its, its military strength. So it, it can't, can't have, so we, it, his, I think his premise is exactly right. Uh, in terms of you know the fiscal cliff we face, is that you know, if it results in in deep defense cuts, which the sequestration would be, I think what that means is that we force hard decisions much much earlier, uh, and the result is much greater risk. Is that you know specifically you start to force a choice between present operations and future capabilities. Uh, when you have that choice, the present almost always wins, but the, uh, the consequence then is that you, you're mortgaging the future. So uh, very bad. Uh, it forces a choice between the, the, what I was talking about earlier, the high end forces and the low end. We're, we're in a world where we actually need both. Uh, if you force us to try and uh, uh, predict uh, which we're going to need and where we want to place our bet, that, that, that's a very bad uh, position to be in because of that 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 Gates commandment. I said we, we don't get it right. Uh, so it, it's uh, I think the danger of the deep kind of cuts out of a, a sequestration like scenario is it forces those choices before we're able to make them in an informed way. Good morning, sir. Gib LaBeouf with Raytheon. Thank Thanks for your remarks this morning. With the uh, downturn on the defense budget, most of the defense companies here are looking to the international market to kind of fill that gap. Uh, you were very instrumental in kicking off with Secretary Gates' uh, export reform initiatives uh, within the U.S. Uh, government. Would you comment on your opinion, now you're on this side, uh, on where you think that's going? How would you grade the government today on that and any of the consequences of not getting it right? Well, export reform or reform of export controls, I think, has, has two different elements. And on one of which I think we've done quite well, the other we're nowhere. The one where we've done pretty well is what the administration or the executive branch can control itself, which is the, the internal processes. So getting down to one list, one agency, one IT system, those are all the, the proposals that President Obama made. They're making great progress on that. And I think they do make a difference. They ease the process. Uh, they speed up the process. They make it less of a competitive disadvantage for U.S. industry. To get more fundamental reform, though, we need legislation. You need to, you need to change uh, some of the, the, uh, the legislative framework on, under which we operate. There, we're nowhere. Uh, and, and frankly, the administration, I don't know whether they're going to try it in the second term. They might. Uh, but I think they're cautioned, frankly, by the prior experience of President Bush who was quite committed to this, and he had a, a, a fairly sympathetic uh, Republican Congress, his own party controlled Congress, and he got nowhere. And it wasn't lack of commitment, uh, and it wasn't lack of ideas. You just, the, 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 the politics of this are just very, very hard in, in trying to get legislative change. So I'm not, not too, uh, too optimistic about legislative change. I'm, I'm quite optimistic that the, the path that the administration's on in terms of administrative change will over the next six to 12 months uh, uh, result in some, some substantial improvements. I'm Nora Bensahel with the Center for New American Security. One of the ways to avoid some of the hard choices you were mentioning if sequestration level cuts happen is to find the sa savings in areas other than capabilities. And I'm wondering from your personal experience with this, what you think are some of the key DOD processes that need to be reformed to find more savings and what uh, some of the key areas are which you would focus at the top of that list? The, I mean, the great hope of every 
the incoming defense secretary is to get the construct that you said, and this is of, of both parties, is to somehow find that there are savings in the, in the management and the overhead of the department, you know, uh, waste, fraud, and abuse, and that you can just cut that out and shift it into the pointy end of the spear. The problem is it's never happened. Uh, it, 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 it's not that people don't find efficiencies, and that and my administration did, prior administrations have, but nobody has actually ever gotten off the line where our cost per soldier, our operating cost per soldier, in other words, just taking the operating budgets uh, and dividing by the number of active duty troops, has been going up at least 3% per year of beyond inflation since at least 1960, if not before. So we just started measuring it in 1960. Uh, and so in that, if you're in that mold, you can keep it. You can try and keep it there. But it's very, very, it, it's, it's very, very hard to think that you're actually going to find a way that makes that, that flattens that curve, because nobody's ever done it. And it, it's, if you did it, you'd have to worry that you were going to compromise productivity, because it, DOD is like every other large industrial organization. What it's done is find greater and greater productivity out of fewer and fewer people. And you know, our force is smaller. Uh, than it was in the, you know, in the 60s and the 40s and so on, and far, far more capable. Uh, and it's that productivity increase, and a lot of that productivity increase is coming out of that. I mean, that's where the IT, the information technology, the command and control, all those improvements are largely uh, found there. So, so I think there's a constraining uh, element in this. And it, what that means is that there aren't very many places to go to find those 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 game changing savings that you're talking about, so it's I I think you're you're actually going to have to people are hoping that there are going to be some easy choices uh, in this, and I'm saying there's mostly hard choices. Yep. There are, there are going to always be ways, but I think it's, you're going to find that the, the, the impact is going to take a while and it's going to be modest. You should do it. We should, we should try and find ways to, to buy things more effectively. I think we do do it, you know, things like you know, independent cost estimating in the 70s. There, there have been developments where we, we've improved things and we need to keep finding those, but, but don't think that somehow you, that's solving your problem. That's, that's reducing it to a degree, but it is, it is not going to solve it. Hello, uh, Ken Heinerman with Source Analysis Evaluation Corporation. I'm concerned about our nuclear weapons program and how sequestration is going to affect it. Uh, our plants and laboratories, such as Oak Ridge, Pantex, Livermore, uh, their funding is going down. The facilities are eroding, and uh, I'm concerned about sustaining our capability in nuclear weapons, and also uranium enrichment. We're not even supporting our own enrichment plants that is trying to be built in Piketon, Ohio. But the French has been allowed to uh, <clears throat> build two plants, one uh, at in New Mexico and the other at uh, Idaho. And um, can you comment on the, how sequestration is going to affect the nuclear weapons programs? Well, I mean, I think it already has, actually. I mean, there, there was a, a plan that was developed between the Department of Energy and Department of Defense to modernize the, the, uh, the nuclear infrastructure ac across a, a more than a decade. Uh, the budget cuts of the last several years have, have resulted in, in a, a, a drawing out of that plan, and sequestration, I think, would, would cause you to, you'd have to wonder whether you could execute it uh, at all, so I, I think it's it, it is one it is one of those. Uh, I said that you know what sequestration level cuts would do is is force hard choices earlier than you wanted to make them. I think that's an example of where that would occur. Mr. Lynn, uh, thank you so much. I'd like to give you a big hand uh, for your remarks. Thanks, Thanks very much.
please accept this uh, Naval Institute Press book, In the Shadow of Greatness, written by the class of 2002 of the Naval Academy about the class of 2002 and their post-9-11 service. Thank you again, Great. sir. Thanks very much. Thank you.